half in the bag. I'm filled with more gas than the Hindenburg. Whew. Oh, man, it's cold out there. Yeah. Well, somehow the electricity is still on. Hmm. Mr. Plinkett? Mr. Plinkett, hello, we're here. Hmm. Doesn't look like he's here. Well, he called us to come up and fix his fucking VCR. He better be here. Maybe we should just sit down and wait for him to get back. All right. Wonder where he went. Ugh. Well, what do you say we talk about some feature films? Oh, sure. I just saw The Martian. I would love to talk about that. Oh, you know, I haven't had a chance to see that. Mm. I guess we can't talk about that one then. No. I did see Sicario, though. Oh, I heard that's great. Did you see it? No, I haven't seen that one yet, so I guess we can't talk about Sicario either. <sighs> yeah. One of the best reviewed movies of the year. Well, we're bound to come up with a movie that we've both seen. What about the new James Bourne film, Spectre? It's Spectre, the newest and greatest action-packed James Bond film to date. Although I haven't seen it yet, that's just what I heard. Oh. But I did see something that just came out, The Hunger Games. Mocking Jay Part 2, I think? Oh, I haven't seen that. I haven't even seen the last two Hunger Games movies. Remember when we saw the first one and we liked it and everybody gave us shit? I didn't see one after that. I did see the new penis movie. You know, the new penis movie. <laughs> With, uh, you know, Charlie Brown Hall and Droopy Snoopy and... You know, the Charles Schitt's f uh, film? <laughs> <laughs> he, he wrote those erotic comics. <laughs> Why are you laughing? I don't understand what's so fucking funny. Nothing. You know little Linus? He's the penist. He's, uh, he has a very little penist. I'm sorry, they call it a cock. Well, I know there is one movie that we both saw that everybody's just dying to check out. Victor Frankenstein. Oh, another film called Creed. You're not built for this. These boys come in here, they gotta fight for life. People die in the ring. Your daddy died in the ring. I don't know him. I ain't got nothing to do with me. Creed stars Michael B. Jordan as Adonis Creed, illegitimate son of the late Apollo Creed. In the film, Adonis begins a journey to follow in his dad's footsteps of becoming the best at getting repeatedly punched in the face, while also wanting to step out of his dad's shadow and become his own man that gets repeatedly punched in the face. To accomplish his goals, he seeks the guidance of Rocky Balboa, who trains Adonis using his wisdom of also getting repeatedly punched in the face. Mike, what did you think of Creed? Uh, 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 I liked it a lot. I didn't want to see it at all. Mike, Mike had no interest in seeing this movie, despite the fact that it's getting great reviews. I don't care. Uh, <laughs> I, I <laughs> Is it saw, just that you don't care about Rocky? I don't care about Rocky. I saw Rocky a long time ago. I know Rocky. I haven't seen any Rocky sequels. Um, Not even the one where he fights the Russian? That's the most awesomest one, because he fights a big Russian. All I know is Rocky just, he just, his, his shtick is he gets punched in the face all the time and just keeps fighting, right? Well, his shtick is that he's, he's, he's a lovable dumb guy. Yeah, and he, he he's, has, he's a big lumbering dummy with a heart of gold. He has just, he has more brain damage than Joe Biden. Yes, exactly. Um, uh, yeah, so it's like, okay, I think we should call this episode um, everything that's old is new again. Is that the saying, There's right? Because I'm, yeah. I'm kind of sitting there and I'm just like, all right, you know, uh, the, the, these two movies that we saw, Victor Frankenstein and Creed, were very like similar, where it's like master apprentice kind of thing, like um, Frankenstein and Igor, and then uh, uh, Creed and Rocky, and then you know, and then it's and it's so it's like Frankenstein rehash, Rocky rehash, and and so it, like yeah, I, I especially I looked at the running time of this movie, two hours and fourteen minutes, and I'm like I don't want to do this. I I, I don't want to just watch a boxing movie, and the length of the movie was intimidating to me. And while watching it, I thought, wow, okay, this could be trimmed out. This could be trimmed out. This could be trimmed out, but in hindsight and getting towards the end, I felt the length worked to its advantage, actually. There was 
enough like breathing room and, and build up. And the, it was actually a really wonderfully edited movie, despite the fact that I kept thinking that it needed more editing in comparison to Victor Frankenstein, uh, well, which, which felt like kind of a choppy mess. Yes. Um, we'll get into that later, but um, very, very simple story. Um, uh, your, your intro was probably very appropriate to the fact where I didn't quite fully get the motivation of, of Creed Jr. other than just kind of him finding his path. Yeah. And his path happened to be living up to his father or something. Or stepping out of the shadow of his father. That was a little a little questionable as far as which way it was supposed to be going, because they kind of say both multiple times. It, it was a brilliant idea. Um, it's, a, it's a brilliant way to... Uh, well, I, I'll say, uh, first off, I was coming at this from a completely different angle than you. This was one of my most anticipated movies of the year. Uh, maybe people wouldn't expect this, but I'm actually a huge fan of Rocky. Uh, the sequels get increasingly dumber, but I love the original movie. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Rocky Road. <laughs> I think the first movie is a great movie. I think Rocky Balboa is a great movie. That was intended to be the, the wrap up to the series um, and also redeem the series because five is, is bad and everybody hates it. Would you consider this a reboot of Rocky? In, no, in... no, because it, it actually the thing I liked about it is how much respect it pays for the other movies. Even like I said, they get really dumb. Rocky Four. It's entertaining as hell because it's one of the dumbest movies ever. Is that Rocky in space? That's Rocky fights the Russian. That's Rocky defeats communism by boxing. Oh, right. Um, <laughs> but that's the one where Apollo Creed dies. They cut to Ronald Reagan, the audience going, No, it's an all Give Russian the audience. Old Gipper. And the Russian audience hates Rocky because they're Russian. But then Rocky wins the fight. So then they love him and they love America now. It's the worst. It's the dumbest thing. Oh, wow, that sounds great. But at the beginning of that movie, Dolph Lundgren is the big Russian guy and he's the one who kills Apollo Creed. And now this one is trying to get back to the tone of the original Rocky, very sort of grounded and realistic. Uh, but it has to, but it does still makes a point of of respecting the series as a whole and treating it all as canon. So they mention uh, Apollo dying in the ring. And unfortunately, they don't show flashbacks to that movie because that would be a sharp contrast. I, I, not having seen the other Rocky movies, I was assuming that it was Rocky that punched Apollo Creed to death. No, no. Because they don't even mention the Russian. They, they're like, you were in the they, ring, they, Rocky. They, they rightfully skim over it. No, no. Rocky is uh, Rocky and Apollo fight in the original movie. Yeah. They have a rematch in the second movie, and then they become friends in the third movie. Okay. It's the famous scene in the third movie where they're frolicking in the water together in slow motion, and it's just so romantic. I'm starting to question why you like these films. Uh, that wasn't what I was implying. I was implying you're into water sports. This pitch is from the 10th round of the first fight, right? I heard about a third fight between you and Apollo behind closed doors. Is that true? How do you know all this? I'm a son. So yeah, this one does a good job of, of paying respects to the previous movies. This is the first one, not uh, written by Stallone. Uh, Stallone directed most of the other ones, except for the first and the fifth one. Uh, so it's always been his series. And it's kind of what's kept me liking Stallone all these years, because he's made tons and tons of terrible movies. But uh, he, he gets a pass because of Rocky, because it's such a great movie and a great character. Mm -hmm. uh, and a real uh, sort of avatar for him. Like each movie, and it's, it's an interesting franchise in that like each movie sort of represents where Stallone was in his life and his career at the time. And each one reflects, like like the fifth one, Stallone's a wash up. Uh, he's a loser now, and that's where he was in his career at the time. The fourth one, he was fueled by ego, so the movie's like superficial and dumb, and he's not even the same character anymore. Uh, and now we have this movie where we have this young director, Ryan Coogler, I think, is his name? It he was directed, something like that. He directed a really great movie called Fruitvale Station. That was like his first movie. Um, and then this movie is sort of his step up from that. Younger person coming in and, and sort of propping up Rocky slash Stallone uh, and, and reminding himself and an audience that he can be great when he wants to be. I think we talked about this slightly before where we felt like older actors, not necessarily older actors now, but actors from the previous generation always have that charisma mm -hmm. and new actors are all bland. Yes. <laughs> and, and that Michael B. Jordan 
I, I, he's very, very good in this movie. He's he's a fine actor, but he just he, he's. He, do, he doesn't have that thing, like, because I, I don't give a fuck about boxing. I don't really care about sports movies, but I, I've always loved Rocky. I've loved the character. Mm -hmm. I've loved, loved Stallone's performance. When Stallone's on the screen and when Stallone is talking, I, I, it, it's, it's captivating. It's the best stuff in the movie, And yeah. Michael B. Jordan is a little, he's just like, I'm actor man. I'm, I'm boring actor man. He, he's got a little more charisma than, like, Miles Teller, I think of his Fantastic Four co-star. Well, you know what, uh, that's interesting because I was, Miles Teller was running through my brain a little. Um, Are you in this movie? Yeah, because the Fantastic Four connection, and those two were also in like a Dude Bro movie with um, Zac Efron, like. Uh, oh like, yeah. I, th I think it was called Dude Bro movie. <laughs> I don't know. I, I and and th th there were shades, um, uh, admittingly very pale shades of um, uh, Whiplash yeah. towards the end, where it kind of. Followed that same sort of narrative of of you know the the try hard and I got to do this thing and the ending of this movie and and the the whole boxing match and that that's why I liked the length of two hours and fourteen minutes was because it was a nice build up to that oh sure um, it was like the trench battle at the end of Star Wars you know it's like that's what it's leading up to right. that's what it is they go twelve rounds. Um, and it's well shot. There's a lot of long takes in this, and I, I wanted to bring up the first uh, boxing match where he's like doing it professionally. Yeah, all one shot, yeah. the entire match, and it's flying around them. It gets just yeah. comes in for close-ups. I think there are some some clever cuts. There's probably hidden cuts, but it looks but. like one continuous take, and it has this energy that makes it exciting because yeah. I never really care about the boxing in these movies. Right, uh, but the, it, it was, was just, it, this is good. It was the it was the shooting and then the use of music as well. There was a part where the music ramps. Up and you know the, the, that's what like sports movies and stuff it, like as opposed to an action movie, the, the use of music is always kind of like where do you put it mm -hmm. with this and then it hit it at the right moment and then there was a part where the lighting kind of changed a little and it went dark and and I really thought like the energy the pacing the way it was shot everything was pretty well done and it it was it was giving me slight flashbacks to the end of. Um, of uh, Whiplash, but oh, sure. probably nowhere near. It's not Whiplash. It's not Whiplash, um, but it was it was close, and so I was like, hey, all right, this movie's all right by me. Took a while to get to this point. I was like, I was like a little toddler who didn't want to sit down to eat dinner. You were like, you were, you were no. kicking your feet in the aisle. I was literally dragging you into the theme. Yeah, um, you and were then, throwing your milk cartons around. Yeah, it was just. Uh, spitting up all over myself, throwing my toys, and then by the end I was uh, sucking on my pacifier and watching the film going. And I enjoyed it. Did you think the love interest in this was tacked on and lame? That was the one aspect of the movie I really didn't like. I remember you leaned over to me, because uh, Michael B. Jordan, you know, he lives in LA. He's sort of the opposite of Rocky in that he's a successful young businessman and he decides to quit and leave that all behind and become a professional boxer. So he goes to Philadelphia to be trained by Rocky, moves into his apartment, first night in his apartment, he hears loud music downstairs. The second was, I heard that music. Yeah, he starts to go down to tell him to turn on the music and you just leaned over and you're like, here comes the love interest. And there she was. It was like the most conventional thing. I mean, I know it's a sports movie, it's a Rocky movie, like people kind of expect certain cliches, but there's nothing cliched about the romance in the original Rocky. I think if that movie were made today, people would think uh, uh, Adrian is some sort of like mental disorder. They'd think she's slow. That's how they would interpret it. But yeah. it's sweet, and it's charming, and it's sloppy, and it's great. And in this movie, it's just like, love interests. Now they go on date. She was a love interest who made terrible music. Yeah. And, and also had a degenerative hearing problem, which meant eventually she was going to, ironically, go deaf. Mm hmm And then they never brought that up again. Yeah. Her whole character felt, like, needless and tacked on in this movie. Because it's really about Rocky, and it's about Donna's Creed, them uh, not really having anyone else in their lives and forming their own little units and this sort of encouraging time. each other to, to yeah. fight and be strong. Right, right. And that stuff was really touching and yeah. I thought really well done. I, I like the part, there's a part where he gets into a fight at the music club where she's, she's about to do this big show, and she's like, fuck off, like, 
she takes out her hearing aids yeah. and then she leaves them and then it cuts the, the next shot is him like trying to open the door and, it, and there's this theme of like him just being unwanted because yeah. it starts with him in like a boy's home or a they, they like juvenile, like home. juvenile hall yeah. and he's getting into fights and the, you know the dad died Apollo Creed it wasn't his fault you know he died before he was born and then so he's always been in foster homes and blah 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 so there's this, this theme of people leaving him and if she had been like not by his side the whole movie and kind of turned on him midway through I thought that might have been a nice because it, it, it had this little warm and fuzzy vibe towards the end that I thought it might have needed a little do more better dose of reality like yeah. she's like I'm I'm with this dude now because he can help my music career and, and he's like what you know you're leaving me now and then dun, 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 like or tighten up the relationship with uh, Felicia Rashad Claire Huxtable is that Claire, Claire Huxtable? Huxtable herself is in this movie yep uh, she plays his um, not his biological mother but the widow of Apollo Creed right and she uh, raises him from age 10 on so uh, tightening that up, tightening up why he wants to prove himself as a fighter, other than it's just in his DNA, because he has a really cushy bank job and he makes good money apparently, and he just gets a promotion. But but it's not what he wants. He like, he, he goes yeah. down to Mexico on the weekends and he fights. Yeah, and and treating that as more of a character arc, like why are you fighting? Uh, what do you need to prove? And because he wants to make it on his own, he doesn't want to prove. He should prove that he wants to be, you know, he's as good as his father. But he wants to do it on his own, and uh, it's a little, a little vague. His motivation is a little muddled, but his relationship with Rocky is what kind of drives the movie. That, that's that's the solid core of the movie. Yeah. You see this guy here staring back at you? That's your toughest opponent. Who's next? I believe that's true in the ring, and I think that's true in life. So, boom. Well, Jay, would you recommend uh, Creed? Absolutely. It's my new favorite Sylvester Stallone movie after Rhinestone. But wiser, you created a monster, and they call him freaking Stein. So, Mike, would you recommend Creed? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I guess that's pretty good for a movie that you had no interest in seeing going in. Zero interest whatsoever. But it, it kept my interest and, dare I say, won me over in the end. If you're a little squeamish on uh, people getting punched in the face and a horrific uh, black eye. Oh, yeah. Uh, ugh, ugh, I hate that kind of stuff. <laughs> At least they didn't cut it open. They do that in the original movie. His eye swells shut and he's like, cut me open. So oh, I take yeah. a blade and just go. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Oh. Jay, obviously, yeah. Uh, I would absolutely recommend it. I, I think it works as a standalone movie, just as a satisfying, sort of crowd pleasing, heartwarming movie. It'll tug at your heartstrings. Uh, and if you're a fan of the Rocky movies, definitely uh, it's one of the better ones. You know, there's all this hubbaloo, hubbaloo, blue, about concussions in the NFL and little kids playing football. And I, I remember a shot in this movie where it shows. Michael B. Jordan is fighting, and there's this whole like culture of boxing, and it, sh it pans down. There's two little little boys, and they they have little boxing gloves on, and they're watching, and and it's not. Um, there's no mention of that. Mm. How do you feel about that? How do you feel about this promoting the boxing culture and and really just how violent it is? Well, I think they do a good job of showing just how violent it is. Uh, at the beginning, it's glorified, though. At the it's beginning, glorified. Claire Huxtable is saying, like, don't do this. Like, I had to carry your, your fucking father up the stairs because he was a, a mess. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think it really glorifies it so much as just shows it how it is. But I was thinking during the end, because this has one of the best boxing matches in any of these movies where it actually feels real. Mm -hmm. uh, in some of the earlier movies, they look a little, a little phony, a little silly. But this one, like, you feel each punch. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, man, boxing is a fucked up sport. Uh, Mike, you already answered this, but I think I have a concussion, so I already forgot. Would, would you recommend Creed? Um, I would, but I'd also recommend Nickelback. You should be able to grab one of these birds. Are you serious? I am serious. Chickens are slowing down. <laughs>
Hello, I'm James McAvoy. And I'm Dan Radcliffe. Uh, I play Dr. Victor Frankenstein. And I play Igor in the new film, Victor Frankenstein. A film we're very proud of. Very, very proud of. A film we're very proud of. Very, very proud of. <laughs> Igor, you and I shall be at the very heart of a scientific enterprise that will change the world. We shall create a life out of death. <laughs> it's alive. Victor Frankenstein stars Harry Potter, Professor Xavier, and another character from a movie that's an actor who's also in this. The film is a retelling of the classic Mary Shelley novel Frankenstein. This time, the story is told from the perspective of Igor, a character that is not in the classic Mary Shelley novel Frankenstein. The film shows the budding friendship between Igor and Dr. Frankenstein as they collaborate and make plans to reanimate dead tissue. They finally reanimate the monster in the last 10 minutes of the film. You know, the part of the story that's actually interesting. Jay, what did you think of Apollo Frankenstein? This might be a half in the bag first, in that I don't think I have any opinion on this movie. I saw it. It wasn't bad. It wasn't good. It wasn't exciting or scary or dramatic or funny. I just kind of watched it. It was like staring at the color gray. That's it. That's all I got. <laughs> Thank you. Tune in next week for half of the bag. What did you um, think of Victor Frankenstein? You know what I'll say? The beginning of the movie was like the one clever bit where it starts with a voiceover narration from Igor and he's like, you know this tale. I was like, if the movie just cuts to credits right here, that would be brilliant. Because <laughs> he was right. Well, this is our Everything Old is New Again episode. and It's going to become every episode. I, I was under the impression that this was a prequel or a backstory, which it kind of is. It's a, it's a little bit of both. A little bit of both. <laughs> um, where it was going to be like, this is how Dr. Frankenstein started and how he met Igor, his laboratory assistant. And... Um, and I, I didn't even think they were going to get to Frankenstein, but spoilers, they do. This movie's already out of theaters. We don't need to worry about spoilers. Well, it's like, um, I, I, I kind of thought it was going to be, because the film starts with Igor in the circus. Yes. He's a, he's a clown in the circus. And I was like, oh, okay, you know. And he's a hunchback. He's a hunchback. And um, uh, Victor Frankenstein cures him of his hunchbackness by stabbing him in the back with a giant syringe to remove uh, pus from... Uh, he's not actually hunchback, uh, Frankenstein says. He just has a, a, an, abscess. an abscess. And he decides that just by meeting him. He's just like, that's not a hunchback. He's never examined him or, or even seen him with the shirt off. He just says, that's not a hunchback. And then he shoves a plunger into him and sucks out the goo. Which is one of the better moments, but it just came, came out of nowhere. Where he's just like, oh, he's not a hunchback. Well, let's see, Victor Frankenstein is a little crazy. Um, and he's brilliant. So he was able to diagnose that visually. And I'm all right with that, god damn it. <laughs> I, I, like the, I like the look of this film a lot. I, I was thinking of Tim Burton, especially during that part. I was thinking this reminded me of like a lesser Tim Burton movie, which is every Tim Burton movie now, I guess. But yeah, the the I mean, James McAvoy was really good at it. I, I he had his moments. Yeah, he, I, I, th I thought he was really good. And the the circus stuff, I wish uh, they had spent a little more time there. I, I really liked the look of all that. Uh, I read the script to this movie. I mean, we should make mention this is a Max Landis script and we just had Max here visiting us on the top of Mount Everest. And he did discuss uh, the fact that your script can change a lot throughout the process of making yes. a movie. Yes, yes. Um, and that seems to be the case here because you read the script, I did not. Y yes and no. Um, I wasn't sure, I'm not sure what draft or version of the script I read, but they're like, I'm, I'm reading it and the, the first chunk of it, it, it's very like the script that goes into a little more detail about like um, uh, Igor in the circus and it shows him uh, tending to the wounds of all the circus performers. People are cr more cruel to him. Mm. Um, there, there's a lot of little details that are left out there. One, one specific detail that I'll mention, um, there's the strongman character, and it shows uh, uh, Igor tending to like a broken wrist. And he's like, is it broken or not? You know, 
can, and he's like, well, no, it's not, you know, but it's injured. He's like, can I lift my weights or not? Blah, 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 blah. And then later on in the chase scene when uh, uh, Frankenstein and Igor are escaping, um, Igor remembers that the strongman's wrist is injured and uses it to his advantage. And there's a couple little things like that that are set up. And then the, uh, all lots of that stuff is cut out. The, the general flow of it is still the same. Okay. The general ideas are still the same. And then I'm watching it, and I felt the natural end of the movie was when they escape the, um, uh, the constable. Yeah. Um, when he, he doesn't have a warrant, he suspects Frankenstein of doing nefarious satanic things in his secret laboratory. And they're like, you need a warrant to bust in. Um, in the script, it's be, he wants to check Igor's shoes because he finds one of his shoes. Mm. And this, it's a little more dramatic. It's, I want to just come in and raid your whole operation. Uh, and then it, it felt like the natural conclusion. And then it goes on, and then they do the whole Frankenstein thing. And then, then it's sort of. Well, you can't make a Frankenstein movie and not put the monster in. If it were my guess, I would say like that was some studio meddling going. You can't have a Frankenstein movie without a fucking Frankenstein. Sure. Well, where's the Frankenstein monster? But it's in this version of the script. Yeah. And, and. I don't know. It, 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 so it was less of a uh, the early adventures of how you know Frankenstein met Igor, and more of a kind of a retelling of. It's here's what they did a couple days before the monster. Yeah. And then here's the monster. And I like that, but it seemed a little rushed because it goes from Frankenstein uh, kind of animating some eyeballs and some goo to kind of reanimating. Uh, like a chimpanzee monster hybrid. Yeah, it's that, like a combination of different animal parts. Yeah, it goes completely it. wild and it's insane and they have to kill it. I kind of like that part. Th no, I, lo I, I, I love all that stuff. And But then it, it's like, boom, Frankenstein's next. Yeah. And it, it felt, that part felt like it should have been 10 years later, yeah. when really it was more like a week later. The, yeah, the whole thing felt pretty rushed. I'm Detective Inspector Turpin. I'm here to investigate missing body parts. I'm not sure what you mean, sir. Well, you're not afraid to challenge the natural order, Mr. Frankenstein. No, and it's Frankenstein. <laughs> Spoilers. No one cares. What? No one cares. No one saw this movie. Well, yeah, and just in case you plan to see it and okay. you're watching a review, you gotta be, you gotta be fair. All right, we'll skip ahead to this time code. Uh, this time code. Uh, why is it all zeros? Anyways. Uh, and then there are, there's a constable character, the investigator for the Scotland Yard. Um, Is that the guy who ends up with the, 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 the wooden hand? Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's something that I thought was like a missed opportunity. There's this guy, he gets his hand crushed or whatever, and then they show him in the next scene and he has like this wooden hand, like one of those like sculptor hand mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. and they don't do anything with it. Like not that it has to be wacky or anything, but it's like not even like a visual gag. He just has it. And I was like, eh. And his face got melted with electricity and he's lost sight in one eye. Yeah. There, there's a whole story, that, uh, his dead wife is introduced into this, but in the script, uh, he also has a daughter that he's trying to take care of. And, and he is still like, sort of like the, the police guy who is um, uh, religious and then go, and has this like, um, complex about death and because he lost his wife and blah, blah, blah. And in this, um, he dies in the script and then in the end, he gets re accidentally reanimated. So there is a little, there's more to his character too. Okay. That gets pulled out. There's a part where uh, Frankenstein and Igor reanimate a dead baby. Oh my God. And uh, um, it, it accidentally starts on fire. <laughs> and and all, the, all the scientists are like laughing. And then they're like, oh shit, it's alive. I want to see this And movie. then they're like, yeah, and there, there's, a, there's a couple of them. Um, uh, the, the part where Frankenstein and Igor are drinking whiskey and kind of mapping out how they're going to put together Frankenstein. That was the one scene in the movie I thought was fun. Yes. Uh, the, it is even funner as I will read an excerpt from the screenplay. Okay. <clears throat> Drunkest. Igor holding himself up on the board. Victor perched awkwardly in the chair. Both of them unable to talk or breathe through laughter. Igor. Great, giant bosoms all over. They want to give Frankenstein bosoms. Victor, <laughs> yes, and we shall, shall install saddles to ride on the breasts. Giant breasts, and people will say, here come Igor and Victor and their masterpiece of tits. 
That's pretty good. There's some there was there were some silly lines in it. So it sounds like the script had a little more personality to it. The movie it seems like everything was rushed. They they wanted to make it more quick and exciting, so you pull out all those little bits, but yeah, the, you know what? Like it's like a stack of cards. You take too many out, and it just crumbles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. House of cards. House of cards. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. A stack of cards is just sitting there. It wouldn't crumble. It would not crumble. It would just diminish in size. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there were there were some like kind of juvenile esque lines. There was a line about uh, balls that I'll refrain from from getting into, but not too many. Okay. And all of the all of the really good quippy smart dialogue, a, a lot of it was still in there, and it was it was more just like just a different draft. Like I'll take this out, I'll move this here, and the general themes um, remained the same. I will say you you said a lot of like the the quippy stuff is in the script and translated the movie. I think part of my problem is maybe it's the direction, but it felt like nothing really had any sort of energy or that there were lines that were said that maybe were supposed to be funny or clever, but they were just delivered straight, so they fell kind of flat. The only one that really seemed to be trying to do anything was James McAvoy. Daniel Radcliffe was a flat line. All those little side characters, there's a love interest that is like barely even a character in this movie. I don't know if she has more to do in the script, but... Mm -mm. No, she's still just woman. Mm. Mm hmm. We shall create a man after our own image. Questions? Um, well, you're welcome. I think it is time you met our monster. I wanted to read one, one more excerpt. Okay. Michael Finnegan, that's the blonde haired guy, rich kid who funds the experiments. Yes. In the back is Michael Finnegan, 21, dressed in only the finest clothes, refined, handsome, and posh. A child of wealth with an accent so upper crust, he makes Victor and Igor sound like they're from Michigan. Oh, I was very confused about what the point of this movie was. First of all, why is this coming out in November? This is like a Frankenstein movie. It's a monster movie. Why is this out in November? Uh, who's it aimed at? And, and why should we care? Those are the three things I was thinking throughout the whole movie. I was just like, who, who is this for? Um, uh, my answer is the Sherlock Holmes movies worked. Ah, uh, maybe. They're trying to go for that crowd. I know they are, I don't know what studio it even is at this point. I guess they're still with Universal, but there's been talk of trying to do a, uh, cinematic, a cinematic universe, universe with these monsters. I don't know if this is like the first step trying to do that or if that's unrelated to this. I don't know, but I hope it never happens. I don't know. I would say they have about a 19% chance of that working. <laughs> the, the, the 1930s Universal Studios monsters are real hip with the kids these days. Well, they're not even trying to make The mummy! Yeah, the mummy, the mummy is the worst character ever. No one's scared of mummies ever. But the idea of updating these and making them like action movies, I think that's the plan. It's just like the worst idea. It's recognizable. But uh, really, it's weird that this was made after I, Frankenstein. And, yeah. Um, Wasn't there uh, Dracula Untold? Oh, Dracula Untold, was which was like a... I, I'm assuming that was a pure Dracula prequel or Untold... Implies, unseen, Dracula oh, geez, unseen. Oh, jeez. Oh. Un untold implies the story you haven't heard before. Yeah. And, and you know what? That's a whole thing that's going on now, too. Because didn't we watch a trailer for uh, the story behind Moby Dick? Oh, yeah. The story that inspired a story that inspired a story. <laughs> like, that looks more exciting than Moby Dick. <laughs> I bet you the real story was they saw a whale. That's where we're at, people. Moby Dick versus Sharknado. <laughs> versus Thor. <laughs> yeah, and then there was something else, the story behind the story. Uh, they're all the story behind the story. Now that's a thing. There's so many trends. Yeah. Movies are just trends. When are we going to get a prequel to Jaws, where it's like the girl that, that gets killed on the beach at the beginning yes, of the movie, yes. where we see where she came yeah. from? She just came right from Woodstock. She, yeah, she's like some hippie. Uh, she rebelled against her parents and she went off on the road. Mm, yeah. She ended up on that beach on that one tragic day. Uh -huh. What about Taxi Driver? Oh God, the little baby Travis Bickle? He drove a bus. Bus Driver, that's the prequel to Taxi Driver? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. We, we I suppose have, we, if you drove a bus full of little kids every day, you would go fucking crazy. Yeah, so. it's it's the early stage. But Travis Bickle was like a like a model citizen, and, <laughs> and he, he was a great dad. And then uh, <laughs> he he started driving a school bus to earn some extra money, and eventually went insane. Well, what else can we make? <laughs> this is kind of fun. <laughs> when are they going to make a Mr. Ed movie? Remember Mr. Ed? Oh, they did. It was called Hot to Trot with a, uh, Bob K. Goldthwait. Fred, we've got to talk straight from the horse's mouth. Ah, jeez, don't scream like that. Oh, bop, bop, loop, bop, lamb, bam, so, Mike, would you recommend Victor Frankenstein? They did that. They did a young Frankenstein reference in the movie. I remember that. Um, I don't know. There, there were a lot of things I liked about it. I, it just became kind of muddled, a little, a little unfocused. I liked, I liked McAvoy in it. I thought it was really good, um, and I liked the look of a lot of things in it. And uh, the, the Frankenstein at the end was neat. It was neat to see a different Frankenstein. And the Frankenstein like, monster looked good. And um, even but, though he's only in it for, for two seconds. Um, but but like you said, who who was this movie for? What was what was it supposed to be funny? Was it was supposed to be like an action movie. Um, I'm, I haven't seen the Sherlock Holmes movies, but I'm assuming Those they're, are action movies, they're yeah. uh, more action oriented and more witty. Yeah. And this isn't quite action oriented, and isn't quite as witty as it could be. Um, I would only recommend it if you are a hardcore fan of uh, Frankenstein. I, I was wondering why people were in the theater. Like I looked around and I was like, <laughs> like are, do people... why, What did they, yeah, what about this appealed to them? So I was like, are people Frankenstein fans? Is there like a thing? <laughs> I don't there? think anyone's a hardcore fan of Frankenstein. Pe pe people that are into, uh, uh, what's that, what's that, ste steampunks? <laughs> like it might be in like the Victorian era uh, with uh, monsters. I think, and you're, I think you're reaching here. Like like um, who is the fan base? Yeah. You know. So that's that's what I, that's my problem with it. That's why I wouldn't recommend it. Is because it doesn't seem to be aimed at anybody. It doesn't really have any sort of uh, tone or style that that makes it unique, or makes it stand out, or makes it interesting. If you're looking for a new weird take on Frankenstein, watch Frankenhooker, directed by Frank Henenlotter. Well, uh, I guess uh, we're gonna have to watch Rhinestone over and 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 over again until Mr. Plinka comes back. Oh my God, am I in heaven? <laughs> this should just be a uh, an infinity symbol on here. Get ready. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm gonna have all these pills. Okay.